Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Can you hear me OK? Am I being picked up on audio? OK, perfect. If you guys can't hear me in the back for some reason, just raise your hand. As uh, Cassandra said, I'm going to be talking about kind of the Girls Gone Strong female fitness formula today. And I can't lie, I don't love the term female fitness formula, but it is kind of what it is, right? It's the formula or the template that we believe at Girls Gone Strong is what can help women look good, feel good, and feel healthy and strong. And I love, well, I, part of me loves following uh, Krista Scott Dixon because her talk led up to a lot of what I'm going to talk about as well. I kind of hate following her because she's so amazing. So she sets the, sets the bar up here. But, um, but yeah, that's what I'm going to be talking about today is the Girls Gone Strong formula to look good, feel good, and feel healthy and strong. And part of the technical difficulties we're having is the clicker's not working. So, OK. So Krista talked a lot about your why. OK, why is this important? When clients come to me and they say, you know, I want your help. Will you coach me? We ask them, why are you here? What do you want to achieve? Why are you seeking out help or coaching? And answers vary, but we hear things like, well, I, run a, I want to run a marathon, or I want to fit into my pre-baby jeans, or I want to do a figure competition. Okay, So we have these answers that, that run all along the spectrum of these things that these women want to do, these goals that they're setting for themselves. But when you keep asking the why, why do you want to do that? Why is that important to you? Why, why, why? What we generally find out is that most women boils down to they want to look good, they want to feel good, and they want to feel healthy and strong. But the problem is, no one seems to know how to do this. Should I spin my way to my dream body? Do I do bar classes? Should I eat paleo? Should I be low carb? Should I lift heavy weights? Is that going to make me bulky? I just don't know. I don't know how to look good, feel good, and feel healthy and strong. And a big reason is because for the last However many years, all of the fitness information geared towards women was from the weight loss industry, right? Telling us that we're not thin enough, we're not good enough, we're not pretty enough, and we're not lean enough. And they've been encouraging us to be less. And they say the only way that you can be good enough is if you do this hot new class, right, at this gym. The only way that you're going to be skinny enough or worthy enough is if you take this diet pill that we have. Weight loss is a multi-billion dollar industry that preys on the insecurities of women, telling us what we're not, and encouraging us to be less. And that's what Girls Gone Strong is, and that's what the Women's Fitness Summit is, is to stand up and combat that. That's what the Democracy of Bodies is about. Okay? It's about body autonomy. It's about, it's about looking and feeling the way you want to look, and that being your business and not anyone else's. So the purpose of Girls Gone Strong is to provide really good information. That's what the advisory board is about. It's what all of the other speakers and, and guests are here to do, is to provide really good information to all of you so you all know who to trust. When you have a question, you know one of the speakers here, one of the presenters here, one of the Girls Gone Strong advisory board members, you know that you can rely on that information because they're a woman like you who's been where you are and they have good intentions. They're not trying to tell you that you're not enough. So at Girls Gone Strong, we offer solutions and information, not because you're broken, not because you need to be fixed, but because we want to help you get where you want to be in a sane and sustainable way. So the problem is, like I said, no one knows how to get to this place where they want to look good and feel good, enjoy their life, and in fact, their goal might be preventing them from achieving what they really want. So they say, well, I want to run a marathon, because in their mind, that's what it would take for them to look good and feel good. Right? We've been marketed like this is the way we do it, right? Or they take a bar class, they do spinning. And they think that that's what's going to get them where they want to be. But in fact, it might be something that's keeping them from getting where they want to be. Maybe they're not built to be a runner, right? Krista was showing all these different body types of people who are more predisposed to doing different things. Maybe it hurts their knees or their lower back. Or maybe they actually gain a little bit of body fat when they start running. Okay? So a lot of times, the goal that they set for themselves is actually preventing them from achieving what they want. Another thing that I want to point out is not every woman just wants to look good, feel good, and feel healthy and strong. Some people want to do badass stuff, right? And that's totally fine, and we love that and support that. But it's extremely important to remember that those types of goals generally, the really hard and intense stuff, has a shelf life. Okay? So for those of you who in here has done something kind of on the extreme side, figure, marathon, powerlifting, CrossFit, those kinds of things, raise your hand. 
Okay, perfect. So I've done that, and you'll hear a little bit about that later. Generally, that kind of intense stuff has a shelf life, and that's fine, because your goals are gonna change over time, like Krista said, but the problem is, if you don't know where that baseline is of looking good, feeling good, and feeling healthy and strong, you're not gonna know how to get back there when the lights turn off. And that's when you're like, well, who am I if I don't compete in figure anymore? Who am I if I'm not that super lean, crazy chick that's at the gym every morning at 5 a.m.? And so women end up in a really hard place. Sometimes they do nothing because they don't know what to do. I remember being 24 years old, or I'm sorry, no, 21 years old and standing in the grocery store after a figure competition and I'm like, I don't, I don't know what to buy. I don't have a meal plan. I'd been feeding myself for years, right? And I'm like, I don't know what to buy. Well, I guess I could buy chicken. Chicken's good, right? Okay, but, but do I buy breasts or do I buy thighs and the skinless or boneless and like marinate? Am I allowed to marinate my chicken? Like, what kind of thought process is that? Where I'm saying, am I allowed to marinate my chicken? Like, that is, that is missing the big rocks, guys. And so that's the problem. If you do have a more extreme goal, that's amazing. It's important to um, realize the possible implications and do what you can to mitigate any negative side effects that would come from it. But knowing where that baseline is of just looking good and feeling good is really important. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my background. Many of you guys might be familiar with this story, but I think it's really important to uh, kind of know what I've been through to find out why, why I've arrived at this place. I'm co-founder and owner of Girls Gone Strong. I'm a former gym owner. I owned a gym in Lexington, Kentucky for four years. We catered primarily to women who wanted to look good, feel good, and feel healthy and strong. And I'm a certified strength and conditioning specialist. So my background background is actually in gymnastics, right? That makes sense. Everyone's like, no, okay. I was a gymnast. I was a competitive gymnast for five years. I um, was a cheerleader in high school. And then at the end of high school and beginning of college, I got very sedentary. Gained a significant amount of weight. So. There I am in February of 2004. I'm looking up because I'm begging my roommate not to get my face in that picture. But that's my before picture. That's when I decided I wanted to get in shape. I had no idea what get in shape meant, but it sounded really good in my, in my mind. So I was like, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get in shape. So I hired a trainer, worked with him for about six weeks. But as a poor college student, I couldn't, couldn't afford to work with him much longer than that. And then about six months later, I started dating a trainer at the gym, which is much more economical. So. <laughs> Started dating a guy at the gym who was a trainer, and he competed in powerlifting and bodybuilding. So naturally, I'm like, well, yeah, that's what I want to do. I want to compete in powerlifting, and I want to compete in figure. So in 2005, I did my first powerlifting meet. It was just kind of on a whim. I walked in the gym one day, and they were doing deficit deadlifts. And I'm like, that looks fun. And I deadlifted like 240 pounds from a deficit and had never done it before. And I was like, is that good? They were like, that's pretty good for your first time. So I decided to compete in powerlifting. So I did a push-pull meet in 2005. And then in 2006, I did my first figure competition. You can see some of those pictures there. The picture on your all's left is 2006. I am angry because I haven't had carbs in about 10 weeks. And on the right um, is 2008. So in 2006, 7, and 8, I competed in figure. After each show, I rebounded very badly. So I did my show, it was down to like 900 calories a day, two hours of cardio. Um, and you know, it was, the, it was quote unquote the best information we had at the time for how to get there. And um, my boyfriend at the time was doing my diet, so he had obviously my best interest at heart, but we just didn't know any better. So I did my first competition in 2006 and then rebounded. And so I was like, well, duh, the only way to get back is to do it again, right? So I did another competition about five or six months later and rebounded very badly. And so I was like, okay, I gotta repair my metabolism. So I uh, read an article called G-Flux Theory by Dr. John Berardi, so of Precision Nutrition, and decided that I was gonna do more activity and eat a lot more food and get my metabolism back up again. So I did that, I got to a place where I looked good, felt good and felt healthy and strong. I was like, well, obviously I'm gonna do another figure competition, right? <laughs> Didn't learn the first time. So I did a third figure competition in 2008, and that's on the far right. And after that, my body just like basically gave me the finger. It was like, why are you doing this to us over and over again? So I remember being 24 years old and sitting on my couch and my boyfriend saying, come upstairs for a second. And I remember thinking, how am I ever gonna get up the stairs? That's the most like devastating feeling. It was my body, I'd lost control. I gained a significant amount of weight and my body wasn't my own. And I went to the doctor, and I was diagnosed with Hashimoto's, which is autoimmune hypothyroidism, 
PCOS, which is polycystic ovarian syndrome, and adrenal dysfunction. So there was a feedback loop issue between my brain and my adrenals. And uh, I was exhausted, gaining weight, physically depressed. I wasn't, I wasn't super mentally depressed, but physically I just felt like I couldn't do anything. And I felt completely out of control of my body. So that was in 2009, early 2009. Started working with a uh, integrative medicine doctor. We kind of started getting my hormones back and, uh, and getting my body under control. And I started feeling pretty good. Around that time, I did another powerlifting competition. And the reason being because I had been so focused on aesthetics for the last three years, I'm like, I've got to switch my focus to performance. Because if I'm focused on aesthetics, then I'm a failure in every way, right? So if I can focus on performance, so I changed my goal to powerlifting, competed in powerlifting. And then for the next couple of years, um, started working with Mike Robertson and Bill Hartman at uh, iFast, Indianapolis Fitness and Sports Training. They're amazing. Started working with them, like Chris was saying, my pelvis position, my rib cage, all doing all this kind of stuff to get fixed. When I saw Mike, he was like, you just deadlifted 341 pounds with your quads and your low back. Congratulations. Let's get you some glutes and some hamstrings and a core. And so I started working with them. They've had a huge influence on, on what I do and, uh, and started feeling good again. So in 2012, um, kind of feeling like I was getting my body back, was getting really strong in the gym. I deadlifted 300 pounds for a double from a deficit belt list. I mean, I was having a really, really good time. And then, let's see, I hit my second wall. January 4th of 2012, my dad died unexpectedly. I found out he was sick on a Saturday and he died on a Tuesday. And at this point in time, this rocked my world, as you can imagine. About six weeks later, I was doing that amazing deadlift in the gym, and I hurt my back. And about four months after that, I got out of a six-year relationship with someone. So moved back home with my parents, left a business that we had together, um, which is not Jim Laird, by the way, my old business partner everyone thought was this. So anyway, totally different. I, uh, another ex-boyfriend left a business we had together. Um, Jim was my, was my uh, brick and mortar gym. Um, and 2012 absolutely rocked my world. And as you can imagine, lifting and eating really well and being really lean was not my top priority. My top priority was taking care of myself. But the problem was, at that point in time, all I knew was being really lean or being really strong. So I thought that I had counteracted not knowing who I was when I wasn't really lean with being really strong. But if I'm not lean or strong, who am I, right? What do I do? How can I be a fitness professional who's not super lean or super strong? And I really, really, really struggled with that. So you can see these pictures the original ones in 2004, and then the ones from beginning of 2013. I'm actually only a pound and a half apart in those two pictures, which is, yay, the power of muscle. It looks very different. I'm 185 pounds in the black and white, and I'm 183.5 pounds in the polka dot. So a pound and a half difference there. But at the same time, this is nine years later, and I was back up almost to my original weight. And so what does that feel like? That feels like complete failure, right? Everyone had known me as this girl who had made this amazing physical transformation. And yes, my body looks different in those photos, but I was still a lot heavier than I was comfortable being. And even worse, it's being criticized by my peers, by my community, and from strangers. I had a male fitness professional stand in my gym, in my office, and tell my staff that I was fat. I'm sorry, he insinuated that I was, but he, yeah, he said that to, in my gym, in my office, to my staff. My community, I had a woman in my community tell women not to come to my gym because they would look like me. And then strangers, right? YouTube, Facebook, why aren't you as lean as you used to be? Are you still working out? Yes, I'm still working out. Thank you very much. In fact, if you'd like to come over here, I can show you how hard I've been working out. <laughs> but that's what I was dealing with. And you know, criticism and an enhanced focus on my appearance, not new to me. So a little bit of background. Um, middle school, I was kind of nerdy, I guess you could say. I didn't have a lot of friends, was kind of a little bit shy. Everybody thought I was a little weird, sense of humor was a little weird. And um, I tried out for cheerleading three times in middle school and never made it, which if you're a former gymnast, like you have to like try to be terrible and not make it, right? <laughs> but it was because I was afraid I got clammed up in front of people. So I never made cheerleading in middle school, kind of nerdy, not a lot of friends. Summer before high school, I basically developed overnight 
I made the cheerleading squad. I started highlighting my hair. And I get there, and everyone's like, oh, who's the new girl? It's like one of those movies, you know, like the makeover or whatever, new girl shows up at school. And I look totally different. And everybody wanted to be my friend. All of these people who thought I wasn't good enough before, wasn't cool enough before, all of a sudden wanted to be my friend. I got attention from girls. I got attention from guys. And in my 13-year-old brain, because I skipped a grade so I was young and whatever, my 13-year-old brain, it's like, oh, OK. So if I look this way on the outside, I'm good enough, and everyone's going to want to be my friend, and they're going to like me. So that became really, really important to me. And that was something that was ingrained in me at a very young age. The way you look is the most important thing, because you're the same person on the inside, but they didn't like you before. In fact, before you were weird, and now you're funny and quirky, right? Because I looked different. And so all of that goes into what my mission is. My mission is to help women discover and accept what their best body looks and feels like with minimal time and effort while having grace and compassion for themselves. And so we're going to talk a little bit today about what that looks like and how I help women achieve that. So again, what women want, they want to look good. They want to lose body fat. In their mind, they want to get toned. They want to maybe look more shapely, the bigger bum, more curves. They want to feel good. More energy, confidence, mood, improved perspective, better health markers. This means something a little bit different to everybody, but they just know they want to feel better, even if they can't put their finger on what it is. They want to feel healthy. They want ease of movement, right? They don't want to hurt all the time. They want to feel less stiff when they wake up in the morning. They just want to feel better, more stamina, more endurance, keep up with their children, be able to go for a hike or a bike or a run if they want to. They want to just all over feel and look good. And they want to feel strong. They want to feel more physically capable, want everyday tasks to become easier, more independence. You know, my grandmother is an um, extremely amazing, really progressive woman. She marched with Dr. Martin Luther King. She interviewed Harry Truman and Winston Churchill. She graduated from college. She was born in 1926. She was college educated. And I was showing her a Girls Gone Strong video one time, and she's like, I like that until you get to the lifting weight stuff. And I said, why? And she said, because strong to me, does, that's not something that a woman should be. That's not something a woman would want to be. So you have this amazingly progressive woman and to her, in her mind, strong is still associated with masculinity. She's like, I don't want to move stuff. I want someone to do that for me, right? <laughs> but she had a stroke a couple years ago, and she's paralyzed on the left side of her body, and she can't move. And I said, you know, Gamma, can we think of strength maybe not so much as masculine, but as independence, and of being capable, and of being able to stand up out of a chair. And so she's, she's kind of slowly starting to come around. She saw me in a Girls Gone Strong shirt, and she told me she wanted one. So I think she's starting, she's starting to come around a little bit. But even the most intelligent, progressive women, it's been ingrained in them that strength is a masculine trait and not something that women should seek. So luckily, the tide is shifting. And that's why so many of you guys are here. But more women today are realizing, I want to be capable. I want to be able to do things on my own. And I want to feel like a badass, right? Who doesn't want to feel like a badass? So all these things that women want. So what does that look like? This requires finding our own personal intersection of aesthetics, lifestyle, health, and performance. And I talk about this a lot because most of the time, if you want to focus too much on any one of those things, which is fine, you just have to know that the others might suffer a little bit. So aesthetics. I did figure competitions, and I wanted to get really lean. Well, no one told me that my health was possibly going to suffer. My performance was going to suffer. I, I knew my lifestyle was going to suffer. I knew that was going to be pretty rough. But no one told me that my health and my performance might suffer. I thought, this is the really healthy thing to do. In fact, I had knockdown, down, drag out fights with my mother because she kept telling me it wasn't healthy. And I was like, well, go get blood work done and compare yours to mine. You know, I, I mean, I was like fighting tooth and nail that it was healthy. No one told me that it might be negatively affecting my health and my performance. So finding that intersection, and this is going to change over time, and that's totally okay. When I went to Italy with my family for two weeks, lifestyle was totally my priority. I was going to eat gelato, and I was going to eat all the cheese, and I was going to you know, enjoy myself. I wasn't going to stress about working out. 
when I got diagnosed with PCOS and Hashimoto's and all those things, health was my priority. You know, I had to eat certain things or do these, you know, different elimination diets and things to try to feel good again. So that affected my lifestyle. You know, it affected my performance in the gym. So if you're focusing on any one of these things at any point in time, the other ones might suffer, but that's okay. Because if you know how to get back to that intersection, it's not a big deal. I didn't go to Italy eat like that for two weeks and then get home and be like, screw it, I already messed up, right? So I'm just going to keep eating like this for the next 50 years, right? I knew exactly where that intersection was and I just got right back there. So it's really important to be honest about your goals and priorities. And being honest with yourself is scary and hard, okay? It's really hard to say, what is my priority right now? Especially if you've kind of always been fit and right now fitness isn't your priority. Maybe your priority is just not to get worse. Like that's sometimes a really great priority. Like if you're in school, okay, if, you've, if you're caring for a family member, if your job is really crazy, like if you're an accountant between January and April, like you have to know that your priority has to be your job and you're just going to do minimum amount possible to stay healthy. So be honest about your goals and priorities. Are they to look good, feel good, and feel healthy and strong? Maybe not. Maybe you want to you know, be a professional fighter. Maybe you want to be really good at CrossFit. That's fine. But just realize that that comes with consequences. Everything does. Again, recognize that the more intense the goal, the shorter the shelf life. And that's OK. But you have to have that plan when the lights turn off. You have to know that it's OK to not do what you were doing forever, especially if you can't keep it up. Okay. So what does this look like? So in general, the formula, the Girls Gone Strong formula to look good and feel good, moderate to heavy strength training, a mix of high and moderate or low intensity cardio, nutritious whole food based diet that supports your goals, adequate restorative sleep, effective stress management techniques, positive self-talk, this one is hugely important, and positive interactions with friends and family and other people around you. So as you can see, we're hitting everything here. We're hitting the physical, the mental, the emotional. All of these things are important. So what does this look like? Let's see. OK, so the moderate to heavy strength training. In general, a focus on compound movements, squats, deadlifts, rows, presses, single limb work, resisting movement with your core, moving your body through full ranges of motion, in general, I recommend two to four days a week of that, and I'll get to how to know how much in a minute. Mostly in the five to 12 rep range, which we know is fantastic for not only adding lean mass, but also for getting stronger. Occasionally in the really heavy range, and occasionally in the a little bit higher, lighter rep range. And again, this might change based on your goals. If you wanna do powerlifting, you're gonna take this template and you're just gonna shift it a little bit, right? So you might be probably lifting four days a week, probably doing more singles and doubles and triples. If you're interested in doing something for physique, maybe you're lifting in a higher rep range. Maybe you're incorporating drop sets and these kinds of things. But in general, this is the formula and consistently progressing your workout over time. So that can be adding weight, that can be increasing volume, that can be decreasing density, which is how much, or increasing density, which is how much work you get done in a period of time. So decreasing rest periods. There's all these different ways to progress, but this is kind of the baseline of what this looks like. So I have like a kind of a sample workout the moderate to heavy strength training. Can you all see that okay? It looks a little fuzzy. Um, so A1 and A2 would be paired together, B1 and B2, and then C1 and C2. And as you can see, full body workout, front squat, so you've got your squat motion, band assisted chin up, you've got vertical pulling, single leg Romanian deadlift, so that's single leg and hip hinge, push up, which is horizontal pressing, Half kneeling palaf press, so you're in a half kneeling position, resisting movement with your core, and then a suitcase carry. So that's gonna be anti-lateral flexion or side bending. So that's just a sample. You can see over time, like week one, you start front squatting at three sets of eight, and you work your way down to four sets of six. So ideally, the weight would be going up every week. There's some comments, there's some rest periods. So that's kind of in general what a moderate to heavy strength training workout would look like for like an intermediate female. Okay, so everybody got that? Perfect. 
Okay, a mix of high and moderate intensity cardio. So for the longest time, everybody was all about the moderate intensity cardio, the running, right, the aerobics. And then we're like, oh, that's the worst thing ever. We're gonna throw that out and running's dumb and this is dumb and that's dumb. And we went, went to the high intensity uh, interval training side of the spectrum. But as it goes, right, somewhere in the middle is probably what makes sense for most people. High intensity interval training in general, one to two days a week, between five and 20 minutes. The perceived effort, so you can use a, like a heart rate monitor or you can use perceived effort. The work period would be somewhere in the eight to 10 on a scale of one to 10 in terms of how much effort you're expending. The rest would be somewhere in the four to six range. Kettlebell swings, hill sprints, circuits, things that you can safely get your intensity up really high. Okay, if you're brand new, you don't need to be doing like, you know, crazy like high rep heavy front squats to get your heart rate up there, right? You'd wanna do like hill sprints or something that's a little bit safer, kettlebell swing, something you can do under fatigue safely. Moderate intensity cardio, one to two days a week, 30 to 40 minutes generally, perceived effort of six to eight, and if you wanna take your heart rate, about in the 120 to 140 beats per minute range, hiking, biking, swimming, light circuits, incline treadmill walking, all of these things are fantastic for moderate intensity cardio. And the moderate intensity cardio is what builds our aerobic base. And people always think, well, you know, it's not important, but it's fantastic for sleep quality. It's fantastic for building up your work capacity so that not only can you lift more weight, like you recover more quickly between sets in the gym, so you can lift heavier for more sets, but you also recover more quickly in between days at the gym. So you can get more of the heavy stuff in. So in general, balancing this strength in cardio so you can see the goal in the top left-hand corner is balance. This would look a little different if it was fat loss or if it was pure strength. And this is just what I have found to work really well with my clients. If you found something a little bit different, I totally understand that. Um, but this is what I found to work really well. So I did it based on how many hours per week you have to devote to exercise, because that's really important. And then also kind of where you are in terms of your ability level. Are you a beginner? Are you intermediate or are you advanced? And you'll notice the beginner that has five to six hours a week of time to exercise isn't doing five to six hours a week of exercise, right? They're doing a little bit less. Just because they have the time to devote to it doesn't necessarily mean that it's best for them. So if they really want to be do doing something during that time, um, they could be doing more restorative activity. They could be doing some foam rolling, some breathing, maybe light warm-ups, really light walking. So. In general, that's kind of the balancing the, the, the strength training and the cardio at different um, hours that you have to devote per week and then different goals. And the other thing is that you should be paying attention to is what's fun to you, okay? What do you enjoy doing? I said this, oh, yeah. Uh, what's your take on incorporating um, cardio with strength, like doing strength training and then going into cardio? Uh, that's a really good question. So she asked about incorporating strength training and cardio. Should you do it on different days? In general, it's totally fine to do them the same day. Um, I tend to prioritize strength over cardio because that's what's a little bit more important to me. If your goal were something like running a marathon, you'd want to do whatever's most important to you first. So you would do your, your cardio first and then your strength training at the end. And if your goal is more strength based, then you do your strength training first. You can absolutely do them the same day. You can do them in the same session or you can split them up. It's basically like, when are you actually going to get in there and get it done? Because that's what it is, right? We have this template of like, hey, this is ideal, guys, but what's going to translate into real life? And that's why I mentioned, what is fun to you, okay? Say you're someone who's intermediate and you have five to six hours a week to strength train, but you don't really like strength training, okay? Like, I, don't, I don't think very many women in this room, I don't think that resonates with you all, so I probably should have picked a better example, but um, maybe you just do it twice a week, okay? Because it is really good for you. It's fantastic for gaining lean mass. It's great for bone density, for confidence, for posture. It's good for all of these things. But if you don't really enjoy it, telling yourself you're gonna go four times a week, like, man, you're not gonna do it. You're just gonna feel like a failure because you didn't do it. So we have this template here, but it's really important to also take into account what's fun to you, what are you good at, what do you like doing, okay? So that's really, really important to keep in mind as well. And same thing with cardio. People are always like, well, what do you, what do, you do for cardio? You lift weights faster, right? 
um, what do you do for cardio? You can do, at least for the moderate intensity cardio, you can do anything that has your heart rate in 120 to 140 beats per minute range. So that could be like a fast paced yoga class, again, hiking, biking, walking, running, anything, anything that keeps your heart rate in that range. And the next is the whole foods based diet. So eating when you're hungry and stopping when you're 80% full. Because we all know there are so many different diets out there, right? What's right for, I've literally done them all. If you saw a blog post I wrote, I'm like, my diet is the intermittent fasting, somewhat paleo, gluten-free, high, moderate, carb cycling, blah, blah, blah. Because that's what I do now, right? Because if you look at all of these quote unquote diets that I'm doing, right? I'm pulling the pieces out of every single one of them that work for me. And what they end up being is just really smart habits. So I eat when I'm hungry and stop when I'm 80% full. My meals are based around protein, vegetables, and fats. The starchy and sugary carbs, based on your activity level, based on how well you handle carbs. With PCOS, I have to be a little bit careful. I've got some insulin issues. So, but in general, that's what meals are based around. 80 to 90% whole nutrient-dense foods and 10 to 20% more kind of indulgent foods. And to implement these principles, and for me, so these are my big rocks, right? Krista talked about big rocks. So we have these different kind of tenets of what almost all intelligent diets are based on. And it's usually based on protein, it's based on vegetables, fruits, starches, fats, it's based on not overeating, not stuffing ourselves, it's based on listening to our bodies, it's based on all of these different things, keeping calories under control. So you have to find out, I nailed these three big rocks because that's what I need in my life. Okay, if you need something different, if you struggle with something different, you might need to focus on different big rocks. For me, I used to stuff myself on a really regular basis. So it was super important to me for one of the main three things that I focus on to eat when I'm hungry and stop when I'm full. It was really important to me. I used to eat, I used to eat fast food like four times a day. It was horrible. It was really important for me to get to a point where most of my meals were based around protein, vegetables, and fats. Okay, that worked really well for me. And then the 80 to 90% whole nutrient dense and 10 to 20% more indulgent, that was important because I used to do the binge thing, right? I would binge and then I would be really upset with myself and I would hate myself and so I would get really good, right? And I'd commit to eating really well for two to three weeks, but I would never make it two to three weeks, right? And then I would binge again and it was on this roller coaster, so it was learning this kind of moderate approach. So for you, if maybe one of the things that's, that's out of this template of, of good nutrition is Alcohol, for example, maybe you normally drink three, four, or five drinks a day or something like that. Like, no judging. Um, but <laughs> that might need to be something that you focus on. I don't drink alcohol because I don't really feel good, maybe once a year or something like that. So that's not something I have to think about because that's not one of the things that was keeping me from eating a healthy diet, right? If you're someone who struggles with eating enough, then stopping when you're 80% full maybe isn't the best thing for you to focus on. Maybe you need a little bit more food. Okay, so it's taking these, these principles of a healthy diet and making sure that your big rocks that you're focusing on are ones that apply to you. To do these things, use a habit-based approach to avoid the diet roller coaster. So for years, I put clients on meal plans, right? I gave them a meal plan to teach them how to eat healthy. And I was like, well, if they can't follow this, I don't really know. I mean, that's their fault, right? But it's not their fault. Changing their diet or following a meal plan is a hugely, like, ginormous undertaking. And they were failing because I was failing them. And even as I evolved, I would give them a meal plan and it would be like less specific, just protein, right? But having to sit down and be like, well, I can't have four ounces of protein at 10 a.m., so what do I do, right? I wasn't giving them the tools to navigate life the way that it really happens. So use habit-based changes to avoid the diet roller coaster. I love what they do at Precision Nutrition, um, how they do new habits every two weeks. We use a lot of those with our clients. Focus on one habit at a time until it's practiced regularly. Identify your non-negotiables and adjust accordingly. So a couple things that are non-negotiable for me, like cream in my coffee, like that's non-negotiable. That's just happening. I'm just not drinking coffee if there's not cream in it. Like it's just not happening. So, uh, ooh, ooh, ooh. Um, cream in my coffee, huge non-negotiable for me. Queso at a Mexican restaurant, massive non-negotiable for me, right? But the alcohol, I could take it or leave it, like different kind of like snack things, not really a big deal for me. Ice cream, cream in my coffee, queso, like that's my shit, right? And I'm gonna have that. And so I'm gonna make adjustments where necessary to be able to fit those things into my diet. And then of course, choose your three big rocks, like I was talking about. The three things that 
might be things that you struggle with a little bit and focus on those one at a time until you're nailing them more consistently. Adequate restorative sleep, seven to nine hours a night. Sorry, four to five hours a night is not cutting it. And I'm like, this is the pot calling the kettle black because if you all know my schedule, I, uh, I um, work a lot, so I stay up late a lot. I do my best work late at night, so it's really hard for me. I have to make myself get in bed and go to bed at a regular hour, and this is something that I'm still practicing on a very regular basis. So seven to nine hours of sleep a night in a cold, dark room, a high quality mattress that supports good spinal alignment. You guys may or may not know, Casey, uh, Casey's the mattress man. If you have any mattress questions, you can ask him, but he owns uh, a couple companies in the mattress industry, so you can ask him questions. Um, turn off electronics at least one hour before bed. I always do that, but it's really important because your brain activity is like, doo -doo 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 -doo, right? If you're looking at your electronics before bed and develop a sleep routine. So this is one thing that I've gotten pretty good at. I do pretty much the same thing at night before bed every time. It's when I brush my teeth, that's when I floss, that's when I take my supplements, right? So develop this kind of sleep routine so your body's like, oh, I know this time of night, right? So it's time for me to go to bed. It's time for me to start winding down. Doing some deep breathing stuff would be really great. This would be a good time to meditate if you're into that. Just anything that you can kind of do to calm yourself back down and get that adequate restorative sleep. Because we don't get better when we're in the gym. We get better when we're recovering from what we do in the gym. Oh, yes, yeah. Sorry. No, you're fine. Um, does it matter when you go to bed? Like, I'm a late, I, I like staying out late. I like going to bed at 2 a.m. and I like waking up at 12. I know, <laughs> I know. So she said, does it matter when you go to bed? So I've, I'm kind of wired like her, going to bed later is what I prefer, but I actually feel worse. So I'm not 100% sure what the, anyone know exactly what the research says on that? Krista, yes? Wonderful, thank you. So, so what Krista said, for those of you that might not hear, is I, I knew there was something magical about going to bed at, I, before midnight. I've always heard that, my doctors have told me that, but I always knew that my body wanted to go to bed much later than that. So what Krista said is there's kind of a sleep type of people who are wired to be super early versus you know normal versus super late, and then there's something magic about going to bed before midnight. So it would be trying to reconcile those two things, because I'm the same as you. I like to stay up late, but it doesn't really feel good to me, even if I get enough sleep. So it's kind of figuring out when can you get yourself in bed. If it's before midnight, because it's regulated by light and darkness, then that's really important. Effective stress management techniques. So do one thing you love every single day for at least 10 to 15 minutes. So it's really easy to get caught up in the hustle and bustle of life and realize like I haven't sat down and read a book in a month, right? I haven't gotten a massage. I haven't gone for a walk that wasn't like productive. You know, I just like aimlessly wander, right? Things do one thing that you love every single day for 10 to 15 minutes really good for lowering your stress levels, just making you a happier person. Work on your breathing patterns. So a lot of us are these like chest and neck breathers, right? We <sighs> That's how I was feeling earlier when our card reader wasn't working for the gear. Um, it, 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 with this like chest and neck breathers, right? Learning to breathe into your <sighs> breathe into your belly, expand circumferentially, not just in the front but in the sides and the back as well. Exhale all of your air fully, getting kind of your rib cage down. All of these things are really good for managing stress. You know when you get really bad news and you lose your breath? There's a reason for that. Okay, it's that sympathetic nervous system fight or flight saying, okay, it's time to go. Okay, so being able to calm yourself down, working on your breathing patterns, making sure you're breathing into your belly. It's a really good idea. You could set a little timer on your phone for just once an hour and just kind of check in with your breath. You know, hand on your chest, hand on your belly. Where's the air going? A gratitude journal. How many of you guys have a gratitude journal? Anybody? Cool. Cool. It looks like about 20, 30% of the room. Those things are amazing. It can be part of, what did you say? A game changer. Game changer, absolutely. It can be something that you do before bed at night. It can be part of your sleep routine to 
tell your body, this is what I'm going to think about for the day. This is what I'm grateful for. This is what happened today. And it can be anything. People think it has to be like this big epic, you know, I won the lottery. It's not that. You know, it's that I, I got a phone call from a friend I hadn't talked to for a long time today. My squats were really awesome at the gym. Or I stopped eating at 80% full, which I haven't done in a while. You know, there's all of these things, these little things that you can be grateful for. It's a game changer. One of my favorite things to do for stress management is when I'm in a really like freaked out or scary situation, will this matter in a year, okay? If the guy in front of me didn't go fast enough for me to make the green light, like that's probably not gonna matter in a year, right? But it's sometimes we're like, go, oh, what is wrong with you? But it doesn't matter. Like if you're letting yourself get worked up over those things, like that stuff's not important. If it will matter in a year, that's when you ask yourself, what can I do about it right now what do I have control over? And you focus on those things. You don't focus on the things you can't control because that will drive you crazy. So when you feel yourself start to get really stressed out, you stop and think, will this matter in a year? If no, forget about it, no big deal. If yes, what can I do about it right now? Positive self-talk. So we all know working out and eating healthfully from a place of negativity is not health. Looking in the mirror and saying, I'm so disgusting, I need to go to the gym. My ass looks terrible, I've got to start squatting. You know, I'm so fat, I'm so undisciplined, I'm so weak, I've got to eat better. It's not a place of health, okay? Develop a mantra. How many of you guys have a mantra that you use? Anybody? I totally recommend developing a mantra. It can feel a little hippy-dippy at first, totally, but this is something that I work on, we work on in our Strongest You coaching program, is every week there's a different mantra that they say, and they're supposed to say it 10 times a day, all throughout the day, over and over again, until the brain starts believing it. It's so funny, because they'll be like, oh, it's a little weird at first, but they'll do it, and then three months in, they don't realize that their entire self-talk has changed. Okay, they speak to themselves differently. They speak to other people differently because they're different on the inside. So a mantra can sound hippy-dippy. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. It could just be, I'm strong. It could be, I am enough. It could be anything that you want. Anything that resonates with you could be your mantra. Toggle it with other habits. So doing your mantra, I think that's really important. You'll get to the end of the day and be like, God oh, dang, I forgot to say my mantra today. I'm gonna say it 10 times real fast, right? <laughs> Toggling it with other habits is critical. So if you do something else a couple times a day, maybe take supplements or just you know drinking water. Every time I drink water, I'm gonna do this. Toggling with other things that you do regularly is extremely helpful. For me, I take my supplements when I brush my teeth at night. So first thing I, you know, right when I'm going to bed, brushing my teeth, I remember I'm gonna take my supplements because I was really bad at taking them for a long time. But when I toggled them with brushing my teeth, it was extremely easy to remember. And then practice. Everyone's like, well, I'm not good at that. It feels weird. Well, you're not good at it because you've never done it, right? So it's like, it's like squats. It's like guitar. It's like math. Like you don't start out being amazing at math, right? You practice it until you get better over time. Same thing with squats. You practice it until you get better over time. Yes? So I'm like in my mid-20s and, and stuff. So in my mind, I should be an adult by now. No. But <laughs> I don't know if that's ever going to happen. No, it doesn't happen. But um, I never had a problem with talking negatively about myself or anything until I got married. Mm. And so I've been married about two and a half years now. And it didn't have anything to do about what I could do physically or performance in the gym or what I looked like or anything like that. And it wasn't because my husband don't, you know, it, it wasn't because he was saying anything. But it was about putting pressure on myself to be an awesome wife all of the time mm. and it's super hard to do yeah <laughs> at all so um and i just now realized this within the past few months mm. and i've done a little bit better about that practice but it it made a huge difference about my self-confidence mm. in every realm of my life yeah so now it's starting to change and that's a good thing that's but wonderful it, it's weird that it happened after like the self-conscious teen years right you know so. Mm -hmm. so Vicky made a really good point. What she said is that she never really struggled with negative self-talk. She's in her mid-20s until she got married, and not because of her husband. She has a fabulous husband, but she was putting pressure on herself to be a really good wife. 
And so she started putting this pressure on herself and if she wasn't meeting those expectations, because being a really good partner is very hard, right? It takes a lot of work. She was putting these expectations on herself and if she wasn't meeting them, she was talking negatively to herself. So that's a really important point. It can start at any point in time. Maybe you feel great until you know, you've know you always like had a great body, had a good relationship with your body, you have a baby. And all of a sudden that body that was so much of your significance and your self-worth doesn't look the same anymore. And you think, well, when I get back to my pre-baby body, I'll be enough, right? I can, I can love my body when, right? I can love my body when I lose 15 pounds, when I have a flat stomach, when I'm finally disciplined to eat the way that I should be eating, right? And that's not how it works. You have to start practicing loving yourself and your body right now as you are, because when you get there, there is not enough. I thought when I did figure competitions, I'd finally be happy because I'd love my body and be lean. And I'd look down and be like, I still have a, a roll on my belly, right? It wasn't enough. I thought when I could bench press 135, squat 225, and deadlift 315, that that would be enough. And that wasn't enough. So it's knowing that you're good enough as you are right now, even if you have to fake that until you make it. That's where the practice comes in. Believing that you're good enough right now, as you are, no strings and no numbers attached. And then positive interactions with others. Take responsibility for how you're being treated. We have Miss Responsibility in the house, Jill Coleman over there, taking radical responsibility for yourself for how you're being treated. Because how you're being treated in a relationship is how you've been allowing the other person to treat you. Okay, and that's really hard. It's like, no, they're just rude and awful and that's why they treat me like this. You know, you, you, maybe they're not the nicest person or maybe they have their own stuff they're working on, but you have to take responsibility for how you're being treated in that relationship to maintain positive interactions. Setting firm boundaries. This one is hard for me. People know that um, I have a hard time saying no. I have a hard time thinking people are gonna be mad at me. I want, I'm a people pleaser, right? I want everybody to like me. So it's really hard for me to set firm boundaries and say, actually, this is how it is and this is how it's gonna stay and I'm really sorry about that. But that improves your interactions with them because they know where the line is, right? If things are wishy-washy and they're expecting one thing and then you really do another or think another or say another, that's when problems happen. But if there's really clear communication with this is okay and this is not okay, then that helps a lot. So saying no more often, again, this is something that I struggle with. I want to say yes to everything. I want people to like me. I want to participate. I want to do this podcast. I want to help this person, right? I want to do all of these things. But I have to know that if I'm doing that out of obligation and not because I want to and not because it's best for me, I'm going to be resentful and my relationship with that person is going to suffer. So saying no more often. And then, again, what other people think of you is none of your business. How many of you all have heard this before? How many of you all feel like it's really, really hard to stick to someone, right? What other people think of you is none of your business because it's about them and not you. You might have seen on Facebook recently, I had a woman at the gym about a week or two ago and I was walking through and she was brand new and so I'm like, hi, you know, like I wave at every, every new woman I see in the gym, super open and friendly and she was just kind of like snub me and I was like, okay, maybe she's focused or whatever. And then later I kind of overheard her um, basically insinuating that I wasn't strong. I was wearing a Girls Gone Strong shirt, basically insinuating to a male power lifter there that I wasn't strong. And I could feel, I was doing weighted pull-ups too, which is very interesting. I was doing pull-ups and later weighted pull-ups and she was insinuating that I wasn't strong and um, found out that her ex-husband is like a really high level strongman athlete. So she has these super high expectations, but not being strong is one of my biggest insecurities because I've struggled with chronic pain, with all of my personal issues that I've been through, not being strong and sometimes feeling like, am I strong enough to, to own Girls Gone Strong? A am I? I think about that, right? And some people look at me and they're like, of course you are. It doesn't matter because it's about what I think about myself and that's something I struggle with. As soon as she directed that comment at me, I mean, I was not good for like the next 30 minutes. I was just like, okay, you know, I was trying to talk myself down. I'm like, what she thinks about me is none of my business. And the five-year-old is like, yes, it is. You know, the five-year-old <laughs> in my brain is like, she's the worst. She's a horrible person. Doesn't she know what you do and how you help women? Like, no, that's what the five-year-old inside me was doing. Because I was so emotional because she hit me right at the core of my insecurities. And it was heartbreaking. It was heartbreaking. And finally, when I was able to come down a little bit off that emotional roller coaster, I'm like, you know what? None of my business, it's about her. I later found out she was going through some really horrible personal, personal life stuff, and it was about her, it wasn't about me. 
her judging my strength was 100% about how she felt about herself and her own strength and these standards that she was setting. So what other people think of you is none of your business. Okay, so to recap, because we're running out of time, to look and feel your best, it's important to take an, a, an, a holistic approach to your self-care. Okay, it's not just training, it's not just eating, it's all of these things. The physical, mental, and emotional work all matters. It's all important, and one without the other, or two without the third, okay, is, is not true health. Focus on doing 80% right 80% of the time. Like I said, I struggle with the sleep aspect of things. I, you know, I eat well most of the time, positive interactions with people, sleep is where I struggle, but I don't beat myself up about that, okay? I work on doing 80% right 80% of the time. If your goals are different, your formula will look different, and that's okay. And what I said last year is the reason that this formula is so important is because it doesn't matter if you're in the gym today and it doesn't matter if you're in the gym tomorrow. It matters if you're in the gym 20 years from now. So do you know what to do when stuff gets hard? Do you know that when you get really busy, you might miss the gym for a couple weeks and that's okay. You're not off the wagon and all is not lost. If you know kind of the formula or the template of what it takes to look good and feel good forever, you always know how to go back there. You're not a failure. You're not weak. You're not undisciplined. You know how to get back to that place that's specific to you that will help you look good and feel good for the rest of your life. Questions, which we don't have time for, so that's great. Um, <laughs> we'll have a, we will be doing a round table at some point, and of course you all can always come grab me, but um, thank you so much, guys. I really appreciate it.